Both Israel and Iran have elected new leaders earlier this month with um, Mr. Bennett's coalition government in Israel ending 12 years of Benjamin Netanyahu while in Iran. Hardline cleric Abraham Raisi is set to start his presidential term on August the 3rd following a rather controversial vote. The change of leaders in both countries presents a pressing challenge for the Biden administration in the US amid tensions with Tehran and talks of reviving the 2050 nuclear deal, as well as attempts to reset US-Israeli ties and address the Israeli-Palestinian question. How will the new faces of leadership among the two rival countries affect regional politics and security? To address this issue, we have today joining, up, uh, joining us today, uh, Mazad Bajerdi, Director of Public and International Affairs at Virginia Tech, and David Mednikoff, Chair of the Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies and Associate Professor of Middle Eastern Studies and Public Policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And well, there's quite a lot of ground to cover. So going straight into the question, starting with you, Professor Bajerdi. Now, officials in both uh, Washington and Tehran, they've contended that Iran's supreme leader, um, Mr. Khamenei, wants to restore the 2050 nuclear agreement with the West before Rouhani leaves office. How possible do you think this really is during this five week window of opportunity? Um, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, now? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, um, I think it's best for Iran to try to uh, wrap up the deal by August before um, this uh, new administration comes into uh, power for the following reason um, is that, um, you know, the, the new administration can basically take advantage of the benefits that a rejuvenated nuclear program can bring with it. And at the same time, we can try to put all the blame for whatever that might you know, not work on the outgoing administration of uh, Mr. Rouhani. It seems like the problem in the negotiations that are taking place in Vienna right now really has to do with what it is that Iran is asking for in terms of lifting of sanctions. Um, in particular, it seems that they are asking for uh, lifting sanctions on the supreme leader and also on the newly elected president, Mr. Ibrahim Raisi. And uh, I think that's part of the problem for the Biden administration to see whether they want to agree to those terms uh, or, or not uh, in, in the first place. And um, Professor Vajadi, that seems to be, there seems to be quite divided opinions on Mr. Raisi's approach to engaging with Washington and uh, rejoining the nuclear pact. Some people are seeing it as a crisis other than opportunity to perhaps convince more hardline figures to get on board. What do you think uh, Mr. Raisi's presidency means for the US and the West? And uh, will the incoming Iranian president really reject a meeting with uh, US President Joe Biden, as he said? President-elect Raisi basically needs a nuclear deal for the following reason. If he wants to do anything, he needs the, the money that can be released as part of the nuclear uh, negotiations. Um, without that money, there is really no option for him to be able to do much. Uh, so none of those campaign promises, in other words, can be fulfilled if he doesn't have that, that, that money. Besides, remember that Supreme leader is also supportive uh, a nuclear deal and and working this up. So it seems to me that Iran does not really have, you know, um, many options in this regard in terms of signing on the dotted line. Now, the, as far as whether Mr. Raisi might um, be willing to meet with President Biden, frankly, I don't think that's crucial, and I don't think Iran's domestic circumstances will presently allow for such a meeting uh, because of all the things that the, the political camp that he represents, meaning the conservatives, have said about the United States government, that doesn't seem to be the case. 
Now, Dr. Mednikov, uh, Israeli's Foreign Minister Yair Lapid told uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken this week that Israel has some serious reservations about the Iranian nuclear deal um, being put together in Vienna. But at the same time, the new right-leaning uh, PM, Naftali Bennett, appears to have toned down the rhetoric on Iran in recent days. How do you think Israeli's new coalition government is going to approach this issue and with uh, Arab Gulf states also worried about Iran's nuclear capabilities. Do you see them uh, shifting more towards Israel? Uh, thank you. I think that, um, you know, no Israeli government is ever going to want to approach Iran um, with a policy other than sticks. You know, most most countries use a combination of incentives and, and threats. Uh, Israel and Iran see each other as um, implacable enemies. And so Israel's really not going to at least publicly change its um, tone on Iran, and that's what we've been seeing. On the other hand, because the new Israeli government very much wants to um, get along with the United States, understands that, um, like, like President Biden, there's a desire to put behind the authoritarian politics of um, of Netanyahu and also of Trump, there's going to be much more, you know, at least understanding that the United States approach will be one of trying to delicately balance carrots and sticks. Um, so I think what we're seeing is an agreement to disagree. You know, I mean, Israel, Israeli leaders will always pressure the United States not to go to the table with Iran, but the United States will try to do that. And moreover, as you suggest, I think that Israel's growing cooperation with Arab Gulf states behind the scenes and through diplomacy may well make it easier for Israelis to sort of tolerate in the government um, ongoing U.S. negotiations um, and European negotiations with Iran. And of course, the uh, Israeli foreign minister and um, his U.S. counterpart met in Rome and uh, they were aiming to reset ties and uh, they hoping to, quote, undo the mistakes of the past that left uh, partisan divides in both countries. How do you see the relations between the new administrations playing out, and uh, especially compared to their uh, predecessors? And which areas do you think they need to start unpicking and really cooperating on first? Uh, that's to you, Dr. Mednikov. It's definitely harder than it's going to look on the surface. Um, so, you know, on the surface, as I say, there's no question that the Biden administration and the new um, Lapid-Bennett coalition are looking to put behind um, the very strong kind of personal politics that existed between Trump and, and Netanyahu. You know, Israelis and uh, Americans, for the most part, are, are sick of that type of leadership. So it very much looks like uh, lots of cooperation. And, you know, Israel and the United States obviously have a, a long-standing, um, mutually um, beneficial relationship. Um, the problem is, of course, that on the United States side, there's growing concerns about um, what Israel's been doing with its foreign aid um, and military aid in particular with respect to Palestinians. And on the Israeli side, um, the Israeli Jewish population has largely moved politically to the right um, while the West Bank, Gazan, and um, Palestinian population within the 1967 borders is sort of becoming more unified. And so both countries have domestic challenges um, that will make it actually harder for there to be cooperation on large sort of big picture issues like Palestinian um, statehood, for instance. So I think that what we'll see, and we are seeing so far, is low-hanging fruit, you know, easy things to work on, like health policy, because Israel's been a leader on COVID, um, some negotiations around Iran, uh, you know, more security cooperation, more discussions of the regional balance with the Gulf states, um, you know, things that can seem like they're making progress, while beneath the surface, there really is going to be a lot of tension and reconfiguration on both sides. Now, Dr. Bajardi, uh, the sticking points over the level of sanctions relief and the degree of trust between Tehran and the other signatory countries of the nuclear deal, 
Um, considering all of this, it seems rather difficult in itself to restore the original deal, but some on both sides of the agreement are calling for more gains to be made. How ambitious do you think this new deal should be once uh, talks, while co as talks continue? Right. So, you know, I think um, perhaps the most uh, attractive strategy is to really first try to rejuvenate the nuclear deal, insisting on bringing in other issues, for example, such as missiles or Iran's regional activities in the Middle East, is only going to complicate the matter uh, it tremendously. So, for example, imagine Iran's argument is going to be that, you know, we do need these missiles because we do not really have an air force. Iran's air force you know, is the type of planes that they have predates the 1979 revolution. So they are not going to easily, you know, uh, concede points on those on those issues. For the United States and Israel, the most important issue is the, is the nuclear one. Let's get that one solved. And then you see if there is any willingness, uh, you know, on both sides to really tackle these other uh, type of problems. Uh, even this stuff, the nuclear issue, is in and of itself extremely difficult in light of, you know, the hundreds of sanctions that President Donald Trump imposed on Iran. And now every single one of them needs to be examined to see whether they can be lifted as a way of pleasing the Iranians to try to keep their end of the bargain. Now, Dr. Magnikov, Benjamin Netanyahu, he mostly paid lip service to a two-state solution rather than actively ad advancing it. And the uh, new uh, prime minister, who was Netanyahu's former senior aide, he's very uh, ostentatiously uh, opposed a sovereign Palestinian state, deeming it suicide for Israel. Do you think President Biden will be able to preserve the possibility of a two-state solution? So I think many analysts would now argue that the two-state solution is pretty dead. And the reason for that is a combination of um, the amount, to the extent to which Israel or Israeli settlers have built up settlements and, you know, erased the, the, the green line in the West Bank, um, challenges to Palestinian leadership. And as I mentioned earlier, a right would drift um, in general in Israeli politics. So it's very hard to imagine Israelis and Palestinians um, going to the negotiating table anytime soon. Neither side has a lot of incentive. And so the idea that the United States could broker an agreement is very much not something that I think the Biden administration believes. However, personally, I don't, I, I think that the, the two-state solution is dead to the extent that it depends on direct negotiation only between Israelis, Palestinians, with the U.S. as the intermediary. What I wonder about would be whether a multilateral approach, which is admittedly risky and goes against the idea of settling very specific issues point by point, um, but a multilateral approach that actually brought in the other Arab states, now that Israel's on better terms, that really look to be what we call a grand bargain in international relations, something that really could settle a wider array of issues. At least it's worth considering because, you know, the alternative right now is that, it, that Israelis and Palestinians understand after the recent conflict that the status quo really is explosive and not sustainable, but there really isn't an avenue for the two parties to sit down um, and, and work things out. And certainly the incentive of the current Israeli government is not to do anything. So I'd like to see some more creative, perhaps more multilateral, broader diplomatic approaches, which we really haven't seen tried. Um, apart from that, I don't think we're going to see very much progress on this issue at all. All right. As we're out of time, I'm, I'm afraid this is where we'll have to leave the interview today. But that was Merzad Bajerdi. Director of Public and International Affairs at Virginia Tech, and David Megnikoff, Chair of the Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you both so much for your insights. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.